Hello, hi everybody. Hi. Good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for being here today. I hope everybody is healthy and safe and uh, looking forward to this uh, exciting chaos seminar by Kedar, who you can see here on my side on the screen. So Kedar is a professor at NTU. He was also at A Star before he uh, was at NTU. He got a PhD in mechanical engineering. Uh, but it turns out, Kedar, I'm going to say something in your favor. You think like a physicist. Congratulations. I think that is a compliment. <laughs> yeah, please do. So it's a great pleasure to have you here today. And uh, we're looking forward to, to, to learn from you more about, I know that you have worked on many different things, uh, thermal transport, we even collaborated on that. And uh, you have this big interest in materials and uh, development of materials and so on. And I'm looking forward to learn more about machine learning. So folks, enjoy the talk. Let me remind you, at the end, you can write your questions in the Q&A button. And uh, I, I usually, uh, as you know, uh, are very strict about time. So thank you, Kedar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank um, Antonio for uh, this tremendous uh, opportunity to share our work. Um, I think most of you have attended the chaos seminars before and the people who have presented before me are, are um, definitely stellar. And so I'm just trying to make a little dent here that hopefully piques your interest and at the very minimum gets you to think about how we can use these new tools of machine learning uh, in materials and in physics, of course, and some chemistry. I don't know much chemistry, but I will talk about some, some chemi chemistry work as well that we're doing at the very end. Um, so thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Kedar. I have a joint appointment at the Material Science Department in NTU and at the Institute of Materials Research and Engineering at ASTAR. Um, so just before I start, there is actually uh, uh, every other week, uh, myself and my close collaborator, Professor Tonio Bunasisi from MIT, we organize a machine learning meetup where we apply machine learning to material science. So if your research is at the intersection of data science and chemistry or materials or systems, or you want to apply machine learning and you want to grow your career into this area, feel free to email me and I will add you to our Slack channel. We have an active list of about 80 people or so, about 50 to 60 people who come and actually listen to it. And, and we want to focus on open source research, not always published. Sometimes we basically look at um, preprints of papers. Uh, some of the ideas that I will show you today are along that line as well. Okay, so please feel free to email me and I will add you to the, uh, the group. As a little bit about myself, as Antonio mentioned, um, I've done a few things in the past. I've worked on nano engineering materials, uh, nano engineering materials in my PhD, worked on one dimensional nanowires, uh, silicon, vanadium dioxide, titanium dioxide, etc. And then I got interested in 2D materials during my short postdoc in Berkeley. And after coming to Singapore, I've worked on inorganic organic hybrid materials, where actually the interface is very interesting. And the material does not behave, even though it's a condensed matter, it is not a completely an ordered condensed matter. So you actually get very interesting properties, which are very difficult to model in some cases. So we have some work there on charge and heat transport here. And uh, we built a bunch of capabilities, equipments, uh, low temperature cryostats, uh, electrical and thermal uh, magnetic measurements, et cetera. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge ASTAR uh, for my funding, um, both to the PSF in 2014 and the ASTAR Faro's Blue Sky Research. And recently, and this is what I will focus much of my work on, uh, is on applying machine learning, automation, and high throughput computing in material science. So we call it AI in your math science. And I'm leading this program uh, with many strong collaborators across Singapore, uh, both in NUS and NTU. Uh, here's a list of publications uh, just to show you what we have done. Uh, if you're interested about anything in particular from 2D materials to inorganic organic materials or thermal conductance and nanowires, for example, feel free to email me. I will actually talk about the uh, motivation for using machine, machine learning and talk about two papers that uh, are close to what uh, are my favorites in the last few years. So the first one is something we published in Science in 2017. 
Uh, the experimental work was done in Berkeley. And then recently, we just got a paper accepted with Antonio's collaboration, so Lo Kanping and John Tong in NUS, um, which again, I'll talk about. And, and I'll give you a perspective on why machine learning is actually very useful. Right? So this is the first paper where we're looking at uh, anomalous uh, low electronic thermal conductivity in metallic vanadium dioxide. So this is published in 2017. Vanadium dioxide is a very interesting material. So for those who are familiar with this, it's, uh, it escapes many explanations. Okay, so what happens is at about 68 degrees Celsius, it undergoes both a structural as well as electronic transition. Okay, so it goes from a monoclinic phase to a rutile phase. At the same time, the electronic transition goes from insulating, you see the resistance dropping as a function of temperature, to metallic, where the resistance is dropping, increasing as a function of temperature, linearly. Okay. And for a very long time, there was a huge debate as to what is the exact nature of this transition? What happens first? Does the structural transition happen first or the electronic transition happen first? And that was an outstanding question. There's many seminal papers in this field. So we were actually studying this metal insulated transition. We were trying to make these sort of devices. Uh, these very beautiful single crystal VO2 wires were made by Professor Jin Chia Wu's group uh, in UC Berkeley in the material science department. What we observed was rather interesting, right? So I've shown you the electrical transport properties here, but what happens for the thermal properties? So you can see that there's a two to four order magnitude change in the electrical properties of vanadium dioxide at this transition point, right? As you can see here. So this is resistance. When it changes to resistivity or the conductivity, which is the intrinsic property, you can see a four order magnitude change for single crystal vanadium dioxide. Well, what is fascinating is that we actually studied the thermal conductivity of that same material across the transition, so 340 Kelvin. And what you see here is for four different samples, there is no change in the total thermal conductivity at this transition point. Right? So the conduct electrical conductivity changes by two orders of magnitude, but the total thermal conductivity remains unchanged. So this is rather perplexing, right? So some of this work was actually reported in 1970s um, on single crystal VO2 samples. But what separates us now is that we have very high purity uh, single crystal vanadium dioxide wires that we can suspend. And I'll show you how we do those experiments. So for, for those who are familiar with this field, um, you can actually relate the electrical uh, electronic part of the thermal conductivity and the electrical conductivity by the widemann franz law. So it's an empirical law. It's not like the second law of thermodynamics, but essentially you have a coefficient that's actually a constant that correlates the electronic thermal conductivity with the electrical conductivity by the absolute temperature T. Okay, so this is true over many orders of magnitude for a very large range of metals, as you see on this graph. And the coefficient of um, proportionality is the Lorentz number, which is 2.5 times 10 to the power minus eight watt ohm Kelvin squared, right? So what we did was we took this extremely pure vanadium dioxide nanobeam, suspended across these two pads, which are measurement devices. So what you see here is a platinum resistance thermometer as well as a heater. And you see four probes here that allow you to measure the electrical conductivity directly. So in, in the black dots, what you see is when we ramp up the temperature from low temperature to high temperature, and the open black dots are when we cool it down. And again, as I mentioned before, the total thermal conductivity does not change. So if you used this correlation of the Lorentz number, as I explained to you before, multiplied by the four probe electrical conductivity and the absolute temperature, what you should get is this Ke naught value, right? So when it's an insulator, you can imagine the conductivity is very, very small. So the Ke naught is zero. But what you would expect to have in the metallic phase is just the electronic part of thermal conductivity is actually higher than the total value of thermal conductivity. Okay, this is anomalous behavior. Right? There's no reason why this should happen because all the electrons that are suddenly occupied, once you go through the structural transition, you have a lot of electrons that are contributing to conductivity. They should also be contributing to the thermal conductivity because they carry energy and charge, right? But that does not happen in this case. So what's the reason behind that? So this took us down a path which took three years to finish this work. What we did first is I showed you the suspended nanowire platform, and we measured the, the phonon uh, thermal conductivity in the insulating phase. That's what the subscript and the superscript mean. Okay, so because there are no electrons in the insulating phase, we, all we're measuring is the phonon thermal conductivity. Once we do this, 
we actually collaborated with uh, someone at Oak Ridge National Labs, uh, who's now a professor at Duke University, Professor Olivier Delaire, who, who used inelastic X-ray scattering on bulk VO2 and only looked at the phononic part in the metallic phase. So high temperature, metallic part, they can actually look at the line widths of your inelastic X-ray scattering and be able to ascertain from that line width the inverse time of the scattering of the phonons that can then be linked to the phonon thermal conduction. Okay. And for this, you need to do very careful first principles DFT. And for those working in DFT, you can imagine that's quite a challenge because you need to look at the correlation terms as well. The VO2 is not an easy material to the DFT on. But we did all that work just because we cannot assume that when the structure changes from monoclinic to rutile, that the phonon conductivity does not change because the symmetry of the crystal is changing. So now we can then measure the total thermal conductivity in the metallic phase at high temperatures using the suspended nanowire platform. And then you can subtract to obtain the electronic part directly. Right? So it's quite an involved measurement. And using this electronic part in the metallic phase, this is what people haven't studied before, we can then measure the Lorentz number and compare with what you would expect from the Widem and Franz law that I showed you before. Right? So this is clearly violated. And the reason this is happening is because metallic VO2 is a strongly correlated system. Okay? For those who are not familiar with this, here an electron moves with other electrons in a correlated way. Right? They're actually interacting very closely with each other. So it's an interacting system. So they don't move as individual particles, but they work, they talk to each other very closely. And so they're not just quasi-particles. So in this particular case, it's a non-Fermi liquid and transport of energy and charge occurs through independent diffusion. Okay, so that's the cool part about uh, metallic phase of VO2. So here's an illustration of what I just talked about. For the Druda picture, a gas, you can imagine all the electrons are just scattering off of different things, off the surface, off impurities in the system, out of the phonons in the system, et cetera. And you can use the particle, single particle picture, single quasi-particle picture to explain transport. But that's clearly not the case when you have a correlated system, right? They are, they are so close, so strongly linked to each other that they, they see each other and they're not able to carry heat together because the heat is actually dissipated locally. But they are actually able to carry charge very effectively through. Okay? Because as long as they cross a certain barrier, they're carrying one unit of charge. But that's not true for heat anymore. Okay? So there's quite a bit of nice work that's been done in these sort of uh, non-Fermi liquids. And so we had to borrow that language to try to understand what's happening in our system. Now, here's where the material science comes in. What we found is that when you start doping this material with tungsten, start putting a doping concentration of tungsten anywhere between zero to about 4.5%, your metal insulator transition temperature, noted by these vertical lines here, changes, right? So for pure VO2, this happens at 340 Kelvin. As you start putting tungsten inside, this metal insulator transition temperature decreases, okay? But what also happens is that you restore your jump in the total thermal conductivity. So you can see at the metal insulator transition point for metallic VO2, pure VO2, there's no change in the total thermal conduct conductivity. But that's not true anymore as you start introducing tungsten inside the system because it actually breaks this correlated electron system behavior. Okay? That's what material science actually allows you to do. And here's an example of your Lorentz number, which is measured uh, painstakingly through this platform, divided by the L0, which is the Wittem and Franz value. And you can see that the red dots here, forget about the Seebach coefficient, you can see that it goes from close to 10% of the value and uh, restores up to 60%. And unfortunately, we, because of the solubility limit of tungsten inside BO2, we couldn't go all the way to 8%, we tried, right? But if we can actually get it to 8%, you then expect the correlated behavior to be completely gone and you'll just have regular Druda gas and then you can explain everything as you would classify. Okay, now that's the story that we had, which hopefully you understand and have questions for. But the key here is that this was an anomalous observation as a result of many careful experiments, right? So we actually spent quite a bit of time looking for it. Um, myself and my collaborator actually noticed, it, noticed this in the lab and then we actually did a few careful experiments to figure out why this is happening. Uh, another parallel story comes from 2D materials. So this is work that I did in Berkeley before I moved to Singapore. And you can basically take uh, a 2D material in a field effect transistor uh, geometry with a back gate, which is highly doped P plus silicon. The silicon dioxide here acts as a back gate. This is a single layer of molybdenum disulfide. And we can measure the thermoelectric properties here. So what you have on the left is a heater. You pass current through the heater, 
And through joule heating, you can generate a temperature gradient across your 2D material. And you can measure this temperature gradient with very high accuracy, uh, down to millikelvin, or if you're very careful, down to microkelvin range, by measuring the pore probe resistance of this thermometer here. So you can measure the delta T, and you measure the open circuit voltage, you measure the Seebach coefficient. And of course, you can measure uh, the pore probe conductivity here as well. So for thermoelectrics, a figure of merit, the numerator and the figure of merit, and I'll explain this further uh, later in the slides, is this power factor, which is the Seebach squared times the conductivity. And what you see here for different layers is that we have single layer, two layer, and three layer. And you see that there is no layer dependence, right? The two layer actually has the best performance. And simply because it actually is a system that oddly enough has a high mobility and at the same time has a high effective mass. Okay, and that's a whole different story. I'm not gonna go down there. Please read this paper. And if you have more questions, you can ask me later on. But what we saw, and I think Wu Jing is perhaps in the audience. He's a staff member at IMRI, who's in my team as well. Uh, he was doing work that was simply following up on the high mobility of uh, molybdenum resulfide. And we saw work done by Philip Kim's group, who was then at Columbia and moved to Harvard, that you can actually get very high mobility in six layer uh, MOS2 samples. So we thought, okay, well, let's maximize this power factor by using a six layer sample with a boron nitride underneath. That was a simple idea that we started. But what ensued was actually very, very surprising. What Wu Jing saw was actually the Seebeck coefficient that you expect from n-type MOS2 is negative, right? So you see this blue dot here, it actually peaks slightly and then goes down to zero as you would expect at, at thermodynamic uh, zero Kelvin temperatures. But when you actually put it on boron nitride, we saw that there's a sign change around 100 Kelvin and the magnitude of the CBAC goes up to as high as two millivolts, millivolts per Kelvin. Okay, this is extremely surprising. Typically your values are around 200 microvolts per Kelvin. These, uh, there are two significant anomalous effects here. You have a very large value of the CBAC, and even though it's a majority n-type system, you get a positive CBAC. Okay, this typically does not happen, especially for large band gap materials. And then we dug deeper as to why this is happening. Again, we observed it, we confirmed it, and in collaboration with Professor Lokian Ping's group and Professor uh, Castroneto, we found that these uh, sulfur vacancies that you see here in this very high, nice high-resolution STM picture result in band hybridization. So in a pure uh, MOS2 sample, you can see the very nice high resolution STM picture. You have these coming due to zone folding or just multi-layer samples, right? But in these points, in the vicinity of sulfur vacancy, you actually see the band hybridize, okay? And when the band hybridizes, what ends up happening is that you get a local magnetic moment that flips your electrons that are moving in the system. This is rather fascinating, okay? So, this is the effect that we call a, a condo resonance. So as long as you have a resonance state close to the Fermi level of where all your electrons are, you can actually have a flip in the direction of where the electrons are moving. Okay. So that's what you see in the cartoon illustration here. The magnetic impurities cause your charges to be flipped in the wrong direction. And a rather weird behavior show, uh, shows up. The mobility is inversely proportional to the scattering time, which does not happen, right? If you, if you know the definition of mobility, it's, in an e squared uh, e, uh, e square tau or m, so it should be proportional to tau. But in the condo picture, it's actually inversely proportional to the scattering time. Okay, so again, this uh, is just published. It should be online um, this week. Um, but uh, the key here is that it is again an anomalous observation as a result of many careful experiments. Right? So how do we then go from anomalies to discovery? This is the motivation of why I'm actually very interested in applying machine learning to material science. So typically what you would do is by chance or with a very experienced researcher, you observe a new phenomenon, then you do careful experimentation. And if that's true and repeatable, you then look for a theoretical explanation, right? So uh, the new theories emerge typically as an experimentalist, you do a large number of experiments, you need to design what experiments to do next. Your hypotheses that you have that it's going to give you something interesting are more, more often than not wrong, right? But then you actually want to, invert this paradigm, right? So you want to do what's called inverse design, where not only can you determine what process will determine your target property, but also figure out how can you tune those processes in an efficient fashion. So in the example of vanadium dioxide, uh, an inverse design would be, well, what would happen if you put tungsten? If, if a machine can tell you that, you know what, you actually have violation of vitamin trans law, by putting tungsten inside the system, you should be able to tune uh, whether the Lorentz number is valid or not. And true discovery would then happen when you extrapolate beyond this existing knowledge, 
when you actually have a good theoretical explanation that is not conventional knowledge. So that's what we would aspire to do. And so, for example, if you have a high temperature superconductor, can you map out the phase diagram completely? Right. So mapping out the phase diagram is is extremely challenging task because you'd have to make uh, uh, measure and control the pressure as well as the temperature, perhaps with doping that changes things, etc. So it's a very complex problem. So it's a large parameter scope, right? So we'll take a break here, right? So if you look at materials innovation in general, and remember we're looking for anomalies, uh, what do you think is the greatest invention of the 20th century? Right? At least one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century. Of course, there's the iPhone and electronics and the IC, the integrated circuit, but it's the food is, was actually enabled by fertilizers. So the Harbor Bosch process was actually a pretty innovative because it allowed you to actually have nitrogen uh, separated from ammonia this is a catalytic process at high temperatures and high pressures, it's still iron, right? And then it allows you to then gen, uh, feed 7 billion people today, right? So the way this works is there are four beds of catalysts with cooling between each pass so as to maintain a reasonable equilibrium constant. So each pass is only 15% conversion, but in a closed system, when you actually control everything properly, you can get an overall conversion of 97%. So if you look at the technology innovation, the process was discovered by Harbor in 1905 in the lab, and the throughput was only about 125 milliliters per hour. Okay, that's basically how much you can carry on the plane, right? 100, mill 100 milliliters. And Bosch actually industrialized this to 20 tons per day, right? Within a period of eight years. And this was accelerated by the World War. So if you want to know the history of that, you can go and read, uh, sorry for the small font, but you can read the Nature Geoscience paper that came out in 2008 which talks about how a century of ammonia synthesis changed the world, right? But this is typically not true for other materials innovations, right? So in my case, which is nowhere close to this, just getting vanadium dioxide to behave and understand what's happening took us four years of experimental work in the lab, right? But actual development cycles for Teflon, gallium arsenide, fuel cells, lithium ion batteries take 20 to 25 years from going from a lab scale demo uh, to actually scaling up to a product, right? And of course, this is not uh, consistent with many development timelines that, that you have, like government and funding, et cetera, is two to five years. Students and postdocs typically escape with the best recipes in two to three years, and then try getting a new student without any training to, to replicate the old recipe. It's usually very, very hard. And of course, IP leakage, right? So if you want to solve grand challenges, what you want to do is accelerate the R&D timelines, right? So if you look at clean tech, for example, and this slide is courtesy Benjamin Gaddy and Tony Bonacisi, Acknowledgements to them for providing this input. Typically, you have about 8.6 return to investment from clean tech, whereas software gives you about 11.6 uh, return on investment. Right? So the numbers are actually of the same order. The reason clean tech investments are much harder is because you can see that the number of years it takes to exit is much higher. Like I mentioned, the development timeline can be 20 to 25 years. For small volume uh, startups, it's somewhere around eight years. So this bimodal distribution that you see Four years is the same as software because they are software-based clean tech companies, right? So it actually takes longer for you to have hardware-based commercialization, right? And this is because material synthesis and materials problem are very, very complex. It is difficult to have a forward model that can predict exactly how you would get from constituent ions, atoms, or molecules into a bulk crystal or even a system that functions as you want to function. So I'll give you an example from my background uh, in thermoelectrics and how we are starting to use um, machine learning in this case. So the example I'll talk about is thermoelectrics. What happens in thermoelectrics, as I've shown you before, is you can convert heat energy into electricity. Okay. So your, your working gas, a refrigerant, if you may, in a thermodynamic cycle, is a highly doped semiconductor, so P or N type. Okay. So P type semiconductor uh, carries charges, Okay, in this case, holes, an n-type semiconductor carries electrons, and depending on, uh, and they're diffusing from the hot source to the cold source. So you have a temperature gradient that you maintain, and as the charges diffuse, you actually have current flow through the system, and you get power through your external circuit. And that's what you see here in your power generation mode. This can, of course, be flipped in a reciprocal fashion to achieve cooling. So Peltier coolers, for example, work on this thermo uh, thermoelectric principle as well. The figure of merit for a thermoelectric efficiency, it's related to the Carnot efficiency. This is your prefactor in the front, which is basically the delta T divided by the hot side temperature, right? So you can never beat Carnot efficiency, but you can scale it by a term here, which is determined by the material itself. 
And the material, the figure of merit is called ZT, which is equal to the electrical conductivity, the Seebeck squared, the thermodynamic temperature divided by the thermal conductivity. So the thermal conductivity is in the denominator because as long as you can maintain a temperature gradient, you can then have, that's a low thermal conductivity, you can maintain the temperature gradient and you can let the electrons, the charges do all the work. So all the work is actually being done by the charges inside the system. Okay, so the name of the game here is to optimize a material to have large ZT. And the numerator is purely charge dependent. So it depends on the electronic band structure of a material. Whereas the denominator, which I'm not even going to go into, that's a whole different lecture, is thermal conductivity, which depends on the phonons in the system, the lattice vibrations. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to talk about the numerator of the ZT, which is controlled by the electronic band structure of the material. So just for a rule of thumb, uh, thermoelectrics are not ubiquitous. They're not going to replace uh, your power generation or the refrigerator in a house because they are low efficiency systems. Okay, so ZT between 0 0.7 to 2 is where we are today. And if you look at a cold side temperature of 300 Kelvin and a hot side temperature of somewhere around 500 to 700 Kelvin, you get an efficiency of 10 to 20%. Okay, so that's where we are. But the thermodynamic limit is a ZT of infinity, which is the Carnot efficiency. So in principle, if we can get a material ZT of two at low temperatures, that gives you an efficiency of 20%. Okay, that's actually very valuable. Or if you go to higher, higher temperatures, so you could have industries where the hot, size, hot source temperature is much higher. You, if you get a ZT of two, you can get anywhere close to 30%. And then it becomes competitive with, with large scale uh, thermodynamic systems. Okay. So if you look at the history of materials innovation in thermoelectrics, the ZT value that I talked about has gone from about 0 0.5 to 2 to 2.5, okay? And the material that you've studied is actually the same. So a factor of four to five improvement in 60 years of development. So here's an example in, in research where it takes more than 20 to 25 years for you to get a, a competitive value. So if you were to actually task a machine to design a new thermoelectric material, what would you do, right? How would you actually give it the task? What you would tell it is, well, the rules are that it has to be a reasonable electrical conductor. Okay, this is not quite correct. It has to be a semiconductor, highly doped. But at the same time, it has to be a bad thermal conductor, like wood. So that's an ideal um, phonon uh, glass electron crystal material that we are all uh, trying to discover. If you go deeper into the material properties, the Seebeck effect, which is what I described to you before, the open circuit voltage divided by the delta T, the electrical conductivity and the thermal conductivity, these are linked to the material ZT. But of course, you can do a whole bunch of engineering. They are process dependent, right? You can have extrinsic as well as intrinsic properties. And people working in electronic circuits know this very, very well. If you go even deeper, what determines these properties, right? The, the, what determines these properties are the material and transport, transport descriptors. So what describes the material and how the charges move inside that particular material. So the bonding, the crystal structure, the heaviness or the lightness of constituent atoms, whether it's semiconducting, metallic, crystalline, and amorphous, et cetera. And also the, ty the type of processing. So new innovations in technology allow you to control the microstructure, control the dopability, et cetera, right? So what we need to do today is to have a combination of high-performance computing, simulation, and screening, automation, and robotics so that you can increase reproducibility and speed up experimentation. And of course, machine learning that then takes your experimental data and navigates these complex manifolds really fast. So it really acts as a cognitive assistant, right? This is where our program lies. So for you to get to discovery, what we're gonna do is in this very large parameter space where you have so many different processes and so many different material descriptors, how do you navigate through that really fast to build a forward model to not only predict your property, but build an inverse model that tells you what processing knobs and what material knobs do you have to tune to achieve a high value of CT. Okay. That's the goal of what we're after. So that's what I call inverse design of inorganic thermoelectric materials, which is what I'll talk about in the next 15 to 20 minutes or so. So the way you do this, as I mentioned, you take your materials and those are your raw inputs. You have to convert them into a machine readable form, which are going to be vectors. So this is a material descriptor. Right? This is basically a, a vectorial representation of a material. And then you want to be able to predict a certain output. And in between these descriptors and the outputs is your machine learning algorithm. So you can have a variety of different machine learning algorithms uh, that you can have that takes you from the input to the output. So what we did in this work, which is under review in uh, Materials Horizons, 
uh, we learned from some of the work that was done by Jeffrey Grossman's team in MIT. What they did was they took a 3D crystal structure and represented it as a 2D graph. Okay, and when you do that, you have these nodes and the edges that can then determine a material. And they looked at the ground state properties of those materials, which can be calculated through DFT. So things like the band gap, the formation energy, um, et cetera, right? Um, what we did was we actually took other attributes that are not captured in this particular graph model, right? So there are certain DFT dependent descriptors and there are other uh, independent descriptors as well. So we looked at, for example, the range of the atomic weight, the covalent radius, what tells you about the binding within the crystal itself, the electronegativities, um, of course, the doping level, the temperature, uh, which crystal direction you're looking at, and other things that you can calculate from DFT, like what is the SPDF uh, fraction uh, within the conduction of the valence band, the formation energy per atom, the number of sites in the unit cell, the energy above the hull, which tells you about the stability, et cetera. Right? So what you can do is you can take the crystal graph um, and use a neural network to predict a certain ground state property. And in addition to that, you can use DFT for plus Boltzmann transport equations to predict the power factor, right? So this is what it basically looks like. The power factor is the numerator of the ZT, which is electrical conductivity times the C back squared. And that's the output that we're trying to predict. That's the power factor that you see here. So we trained three different models here. Okay, we wanted to see how powerful is this graph convolutional neural network uh, technique. So we took a crystal structure, we did convolution pooling, standard um, uh, uh, fair when you actually do a neural network training. You do these feature maps, use a deep neural network and you predict the power factor. And we appended to that certain atomic descriptors. So the crystal structure is represented and what atoms you put inside the crystal structure are accounted for, accounted for by, the, uh, by the atomic descriptors. In addition to that, we also use uh, more simple uh, tree-based techniques, ensemble learning techniques, such as random forest and XG boost. And here, we actually did not use the graph model at all. We just used the space group number as a one hot encoded vector. We used the DFT dependent descriptors that I showed you before, as well as the discriminative physical outputs, the temperature and the doping level. That's something the user can control, along with the atomic descriptors to also predict the power factor, right? So what you see here is that MIT's pre-trained model, this is Jeff Grossman's lab, you see a very good error, this should be 1.18% for the ground state property. And when we actually use a random forest model, right, an ensemble learning technique, that performs better than any of the neural network network techniques. And this is actually reasonably common uh, in, in science. Okay? These tree-based techniques actually work pretty well uh, for small data sets because we're not looking at like a million images. You're looking at about 10,000 to 20,000 compounds in this case. So this graph here shows you the correlation between the predicted power factor from our forward learning model and the actual power factor as calculated by DFT plus Boltzmann transport equations. So the error here is about 8%, which as an experimentalist, for example, you'd be very happy with. The next step is to actually look at what features determine this forward correlation. So what you can then do is when you look at a combination of all of these features that I've shown here, they turn out to be more than about 40 to 50 descriptors that you can use but not all of them are important, right? As a scientist, you would know what are important and use those. But in the machine learning, you just throw the kitchen sink at it. So we gave it all of the descriptors. And then by doing a recursive feature elimination, you can remove certain features that do not affect your accuracy score. So this is what you do when you do your feature importance. And you find that these top eight features matter quite a lot. And then I can go and interpret this as a scientist, right? Whether the, of course the doping level and the temperature matter, the number of sites is related to the phonon thermal conductivity, for example, and the complexity of the band structure relates uh, to what kind of asymmetry you have and other things inside the Fermi complexity factor. So you can sort of go and interpret that these features are important. What you can also do is things like shaft value analysis, uh, which if you're, in, if you're interested, you can uh, message me. What it does, it tells you uh, the feature effects. So what effect does the doping level have on your power factor? So if you, you have a high value of uh, the doping level, then it has, it has a positive value on your power factor. If you have a low value, it has a negative effect on the power. Factor. So these are tools that we can use from machine learning that then allow you to figure out which features are important to predict the power factor and get good accuracy in predicting it without having any a priori knowledge. So you could essentially take any new material, replace it by these 10 features, right? And then without using DFT or Boltzmann transport equations, predict what the value of the power factor would be. That's the forward model that we run generally. 
Now, that's not enough, right? Because what you'd like to do is inverse design that. So if you want to have a target high value of power factor, how do you then inverse design a new thermoelectric material? So what we did is we used filtering conditions. We said, you know what we need to do is when we want to identify a new material, uh, we apply certain criteria that comes from domain expertise, right? Where you actually have very small changes in what the Fermi level should be, the N side, et cetera. So you look at particular values in the feature in an existing database and say, these attributes have to have these values for you to get a certain value of power factor. And that's what you're doing here. So you shine a flashlight on possible materials within those narrow windows. And what ended up, we ended up getting was actually rather interesting. So we looked at a cubic material system. And when we use this inverse design paradigm, what we found is it basically told us that these half hoister compounds that I showed here, titanium, germanium, platinum, zirconium, indium, gold, et cetera, are very good thermoelectric materials. So this is a surprise because within the class of cubic materials, uh, we domain experts know that the half oysters are actually very good because they actually have high symmetry, but also have a good Fermi surface complexity. And that gives you high power factor. But the machine learning algorithm actually did not know that. And these were five amongst its top seven choices. Right? So that was surprising that the machine learning algorithm learned this. So we, there was no prediction on the power factor for these uh, new compounds. So what we then did was went back and using your DFT and your Boltzmann transport, we validated that these predictions are actually accurate. So what you see on the x-axis here is at different temperatures and different doping levels, you can see that the match between the actual and the predicted is actually pretty good, right? So here's an example where we can look at materials that we haven't looked at before, which the machine learning has predicted based on how you have identified the features that are important. Now, what's interesting is that this TSNE plot that I show on the right-hand side here tells you between the similarity of materials. So this brain-like image that you see here are all the materials that we use for training. So true extrapolation would be the new materials, which are basically orange in color here, would be far away in this uh, reduced dimensional space than the trained crystals. Okay, that's true extrapolated nature. So what we have done is an inverse design for similar materials. What we haven't done is extrapolated to dissimilar materials. That's a much harder challenge, right? So towards that step, uh, in a, a very nice collaboration with Donia Bonasisi's group uh, and Yusung Jung, who's at KAIST, uh, most of the work was done by Zukun Run um, at SMART. What we wanted to do is find an invertible crystal representation. So can you generate a generative design? Can you generate a new crystal that has never been seen before, right? Now, the way we do this is again, we use our domain knowledge. We take our training set, we take crystal structure, you take your atomic descriptors, Okay, and then you can also take uh, your scattering factor. So anybody doing X-ray scattering, for example, knows that your scattering factor is related to your atomic information as well as the period periodicity of that crystal, right? So you can take a vectoral representation that's a combination of your real space and your Fourier space, and that creates a crystal descriptor that looks like a matrix, something like this. Okay, so if you're more interested to read about this, please uh, click on this archive link, and uh, it's under review at this point. Uh, so this way you actually featureize a material. And what's unique here is that we can put this feature through an encoder. We go into a Latin space, which is a reduced material space, it's a two dimensional space. And you can link it to any material property. So you can use a forward model to link it to ground state properties or to functional properties. Okay. And then for a target property, for a target output property, you can then decode new materials. So new crest crystals emerge, which we've never seen before. Right? And that's only possible because of machine learning. So what we did here, for example, we gave it a target property of band gap. This is for photovoltaic applications. And we asked uh, your generative model to predict new crystals that have a band gap value of 1.5 EV. And of course, this is not perfect because the certain things that DFT can do that we cannot do yet are things like relaxation. Right? Are the atoms actually relaxed or not? So those are not encoded inside this inverse design yet. But even without that, seven out of the 14 crystals that we predicted have a target value of EG close to 1.5 within a few percent error. Uh, you can, of course, extend this. Now, the key here is to take new crystals and apply to function properties. So what I don't show here, but you'll see it in the archive paper, uh, is basically you can predict thermoelectric properties as well. Okay. Now, your inverse design is only as good as your database. Right? And what lacks today from materials 
is a high quality database in organic materials, especially in looking at inequilibrium properties, what happens to functional properties, not just in equilibrium. So this is a paper that we just published. Uh, I, I will just briefly touch upon it uh, in collaboration with Dr. Yang Chong's team in IHPC and Junichi Shiomi at the University of Tokyo, where we actually look at uh, your electron scattering times of inorganic crystals with very high accuracy, but at about 10 to 100 times reduced cost. So in a supercomputer, it takes uh, 10 times less time to actually predict the functional properties of these materials. Right. And this way, we've already started and we've gone through about a thousand compounds at this point. Uh, we're wrapping up to about 3,000 inorganic compounds. We can then predict their functional properties directly. Right. And then you can use that database to then uh, look at machine learning methods to predict and do inverse design. Right. So we're in the business of also creating this sort of database. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll do a quick in the last 10 to 10, 12 minutes before I take any questions. Uh, what I'll do is I'll also talk about the experimental side of things, where we're looking at the complexity of real materials, right? So I mentioned before that when you want to get an acceleration of material development, what you want to do is have process conditions that you can tune, have a high throughput synthesis, hopefully with an automated robot, and something that measures directly the performance also in a high throughput fashion. That's what we lack today, high throughput characterization. And you can use a machine learning to actually go back and optimize and do things like hypothesis testing. So you then have a feedback loop that allows you to go from process to property and back. Okay. So this is the key novelty step, which enables you to have full automation and ra rapid acceleration of R&D. So through our domain knowledge in this inorganic organic materials, we actually looked at uh, polymers combined with carbon nanotubes. And there's much reason to domain expertise as to why these are very good. Um, there's a bunch of papers. I, I will not talk about those. But putting a PTHT with carbon nanotube actually gives you very nice values of power. But the problem is that the parameter space is very large. You can change the molecular weight of the polymer, you can change the solvent, you can change the dopant in solution, you can change what type of carbon nanotube you're looking at, how do you enhance your pipe interactions. There's many, many, many parameters. So a student, Daniel Bash, who perhaps is on the call here as well, did the numbers and the parameter space for this comp two component system can be something like 10,000 different experiments, right? which is a very difficult one to achieve, even in a single PhD, for instance. So what we did is developed an automated workflow. So typically you do an experiment, you characterize, you analyze, and you check and test your hypothesis. So we automated through high throughput experiment, the part where we do the experiment experiments, as well as the characterization. The analysis is actually done through machine learning. I'll give you an example of this. And we also do some hypothesis testing. So this is a new idea, uh, which very few people have actually done in material science, right? So we integrate this into the machine learning as well. This is what our setup looks like. This is a continuous flow reactor. So what you see here are syringe pumps and they can actually pump different stock solutions at different rates and different mixing ratios. And you can actually have these plugs that you see here and kudos to Professor Saif Khan's team in NUS who we've actually learned from to implement this. Uh, he's in the chemical engineering department. And what you see white here is the Teflon tubing and it's just gas, the nitrogen gas or argon gas that separates each experimental condition. Right. So you can generate thousands of samples through these plugs. And it's a continuous system because you can look at different composition spaces by changing the ratios of different input materials, the solvent, the stock solutions, you can get different mixing ratios as well. And you can con control the temperatures, et cetera, at the bottom too. Right. Now, the key uh, innovation here was that we wanted to actually measure the optical and electrical properties of these. Right. So you get a flow system. We repurposed the 3D printing stage. So there's zero dollars input into this. And we drop cast this into an, a smooth quartz wafer, which is what you see here. And we can do something like 36 drop cast films within a matter of 10 minutes. And the key bottleneck in this experimental throughput is actually the drying time, right? And there's a lot of engineering that went in to just make sure that you have a reasonably uniform film in that droplet, okay? So that was the key bottleneck in this case. So after you make the wafer and it dries in a few more, we can take it. The robot in this case is a human, okay? but it's dry, so there's no problems. But, and, and that step is not the bottleneck. You can then take it to a hyperspectral camera and within a matter of 30 seconds, you can generate one gigabyte of data and each pixel, which is 150 by 150 microns, is a full spectra from 400 nanometers to 1000 nanometers. So you're then getting all the information about things like pi pi stacking. What is the interaction between carbon nanotubes and your polymer in this case, right? Um, what you can also do is look at thickness. So we spend quite a bit of time calibrating thickness, but I won't talk about that here. 
And then we also have an automated four point probe electrical testing system, which again, we built for about $10,000 or so. so. It's quite a cheap system. So it's a computer controlled XY stage and you can get IV measurements. We, do, we use an imaging algorithm. You can, you can see a little camera on the top. In, initially, we used an iPhone. Later on, we purchased a simple webcam uh, that you can't purchase anymore, apparently, but it's quite cheap. And you can then image the wafer, uh, index all of the points where the dried uh, different composition space is, and bring the four-point probe in with feedback control and measure the focal conductivity of the samples. Okay. Uh, in terms of the machine learning, we focused on Bayesian optimization. Many of the state-of-the-art papers today do this as well. We are doing three things, though. One is we are looking for optimizing pi pi interactions through the optical spectra, and we're directly optimizing for the target, target conductivity. So we want to achieve a very high value of conductivity, which is good for thermoelectrics. And we also optimize for a weighted average of both. So kudos here to Ali Chan Shah, who is a professor in the math department, where they actually had a different implementation of Bayesian optimization, which allows you for looking at different errors of different labels. So the optical conductivity has a very low label, because of the uh, low error, uh, my, sorry, my mistake, uh, but the electrical conductivity is a larger error bar because the thickness can have a 15 to 20 percent error. In addition to that, because we have multiple labeling, we use probability graph models to understand how you can correlate compositions to resistance, conductivity, etc. So there's quite a bit of work that's uh, going on here. And the hypothesis that we wanted to test is that if you take your optimization algorithm that's specifically designed for conductivity, and if you take an optimization algorithm that's specifically designed for your optical absorbance ratio that gives you your pi pi interactions, do they both converge on the same composition space to give you high conductivity, right? So what we have done is in a robust fashion, tested a scientific hypothesis that your pi pi interactions actually give you high values of conductivity, right? And so that's what you see here as the runs go forward. You can see that the conductivity reaches pretty high values uh, up to 1200 Siemens per centimeter. And the peak ratio is an indicator of pi-pi interactions. And that also gives you high values, close to one and higher than one. And in, indeed, we do get uh, similar input compositions that give you high output conductivity. So that's actually pretty nice and something unique that you can do with machine learning. So this is a, a general uh, overview of the platform. We have stock solutions, we do flow processing, uh, we do diagnostics, which is both four-point resistance and hyperspectral imaging. And you have machine learning and there's various different implementations of these, right? And uh, you can do optimization that then tells you what the new experimental conditions are and you have a high throughput loop, right? So you can scan out a large parameter case, space. In this case, it's just a five to one problem. Uh, five to three problem perhaps is basically five inputs and you're looking at optical uh, as well as the electrical conductivities. But in principle, you can scale this up to, to a larger composition space, right? Uh, we only measure 15% of the thickness which is why the speed of the experiments is faster. We can measure anything, something like 160 samples per day, uh, which is 10 times faster than the regular workflow. And we get state-of-the-art electrical conductivity in these samples. It's something that people have done, taken eight to 10 years to measure. We could basically do all of this in about three months or so. So um, what I'll do is I'll show you a quick video of how this works um, before I take any questions. Well within my time limit, this is the flow system where they all mix together. This is the drop casting. You can see they're drop casting here. After they dry, we then pick it up. We take it to the hyperspectral camera, as I showed you before. This is real time. You can see the images coming as the stage translates. And then you can pick up the sample. Hopefully there'll be a robot shuttling this in the future, but you bring it to the four point probe system and you can measure the electrical conductivities as you can see here. This is done through the team in ASTAR. And we can do 150 samples prepare and analyze within a minute. So with that little snippet, I'll stop. Uh, we have a YouTube channel as well on accelerated materials development where we have some workshops. We organized in NUS and ASTAR. Feel free to look at that website. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It was an amazing talk. Uh, uh, really incredible what you guys are doing. So folks, um, do, Kedar, do you want to look at the questions yourself and, yeah. and, and, and answer? Yes, so, yes. yeah, we have like 12 minutes, so. Okay, perfect. Um, cool. So I have about five questions, so two minutes per question. <laughs> so Stefan, thanks for joining the talk. Uh, I know Stefan because he was involved in the AMDM effort. Uh, question Stefan asks, is, should the two rules, good electronic conductor mean high order and poor thermal conductor high disorder, is that true, right? That's a great question. Um, 
it is true in general, but the problem is as you get to high disorder, your electrical conductivity turns to shit, right? If you look at all the body of work that was done by Mott in the 1970s, et cetera, you'll see that disordered systems have very low electrical conductivity, it's a hopping sort of transport. So the key here is to still have crystalline order with reasonably high symmetry, but make the crystal structure complex enough that your phonons scatter very well. So anything that you can do to the crystal structure that allows you uh, to actually scatter the phonons very, very effectively, but not affect your electron mean free path, that can actually uh, give you a very high value of uh, thermal electric power, uh, ZT, for example. So I know I owe you a, a discussion here because I know the ionic materials that you have is something we've discussed but never had the bandwidth to explore properly. Uh, I'll touch base with you separately about that. Uh, but yeah, the, the idea here is things like lone pair electrons, for instance, right? What they do is they manifest as two unbonded electrons. And you can imagine those two unbonded electrons affect the crystal symmetry. And that results in phonon scattering to anharmonicity because the crystal structure symmetry is reduced. And that gives you high values of ZT, for example. Hopefully I answered that question. Uh, Argus, uh, Sun, thanks for your question. Thank you for sharing your research. As you probably know, there's a lot of interest in titanium and titanium oxides for medical devices. Since titanium and vanadium alloys are frequently applied, is it practical look for similar doping, doping effect uh, with titanium as well as tungsten? So I'm guessing this is relevant to the vanadium oxide uh, work that I showed you. Uh, I don't think titanium oxide is a correlated system. Uh, so that might be different. Uh, so this is the interesting thing about vanadium is that the 3D electrons uh, interact very closely with each other. And that's what gives you this weird behavior, right? So VO2 is a, is a fascinating material system. There's many, many magnetic phases. The metal insulator transition depends very, very uh, strongly on how much oxygen you put in this documentary as well. But yes, indeed, if you look at uh, different dopants, for example, in V2O3, which has a lower transition temperature, uh, there might be something happening. In particular, in your particular question for medical devices for titanium vanadium alloys, uh, they're probably metallic is what I'm guessing, in which case uh, you'll just get electrons dominating like crazy. Uh, but you never know. Uh, in the spirit of looking for surprises, if you have some samples that you'd like me to test, I'm happy to pop it into our PPMS and test it out. Right. Um, hey, Hippo from Chris Nyhaus group. So I know Hippo very well. Um, in your chemical intuition slide, there are a range of parameters, including band gap, but if you use nanoscale materials, so 2D materials, molecules, and nanostructure embedded frameworks, the density of states can be a little more complex than that. Actually, in principle, you have a strong dependence on the CVAC coefficient of the derivative. Absolutely. Is it something that you have looked into with this machine learning approach? I expect there's a challenge in itself to obtain these other parameters which go beyond traditional semiconductor parameters. It's a great question, Hippo. Uh, the density of states discretization is what made 2D materials interesting for me to study in the first place, right? And band structure calculations of 2D materials are reasonably routine. Uh, Antonio can do them in his sleep. Uh, uh, Feng Yongping has actually has, has a full database, uh, 2D Matpedia, where they've looked at the band structure. Uh, it's actually uh, computationally not expensive to do BDE on all of these, the Boltzmann transport equation, which accounts for the discretization of the density of states because the band structure is determined already. Uh, but what is not easy to do is the energy relaxation times. And that's where our methodology is very important, right? So you can look at the band structure and calculate uh, your power factor without looking for the relaxation time. But if you want to do the relaxation time properly, your lack of symmetry and how you integrate becomes very complex. Uh, so Dr. Yangshuo Wang, who's my collaborator in IHPC, is actually working on this problem right now. So hopefully we can, we can have an answer for you soon. But yeah, it's a great question. Uh, Biswajit Nayak asks, uh, slide 34, two different parameters are compared. Will absolute error differ com if uh, compared with the same parameters? Um, slide 34. Yeah, so, slide, so, so essentially slide 34, we, it's, it's, it's an extension of the ground state model. Um, I hope you can still see my screen. So I'm, I'm looking at slide 34. So on the left side, you have the prediction for a ground state Fermi energy. We can build upon, upon that to predict the power factor, which is a functional property. So perhaps that's my, uh, my explanation, not very clear in this case. So we're not really comparing these two. Uh, uh, unless your question is, if you're talking about the MAE and the absolute error and the mean absolute error, right? We've looked at both. So this is a, uh, my presentation issue. I probably should have uh, put MAE for both of them. So in, in the preprint, feel free to email me. In the preprint, uh, we actually compare mean absolute error for both of them. Uh, thanks for that question. I should modify my slides based on that. 
43, uh, you didn't understand how these polymers are useful and how high scattering parameters are useful to us. Uh, I'll, I can point you, if you could email me afterwards or I can look up your email, I will send you two of the Nature Communications paper that we published in the last three years. Uh, the simple idea here is that PTHT is a conjugated polymer. So you have long, um, uh, long mean free paths, if you may, of electrons moving through the conjugated backbone. But you have the advantage that the conjugated polymers actually have low intrinsic thermal conductivity because they're not as ordered, right? And then when you mix it with carbon nanotube, the original hypothesis, which we disproved before the machine learning, was that you actually have some sort of energy filtering when you put a metal and a semiconductor together. That's not what's happening here. So what you end up seeing is that you have some sort of charge transport across the interface for a carbon nanotube and a conjugated polymer. And the scattering parameter that you have here uh, is basically something like ionized impurity scattering in a crystal, crystal structure. And that gives you high values of CBAC, which is why PTHT is actually more interesting uh, than other conjugated polymers. It's a great question. And I'm happy to talk about that more. Uh, Ren Lim, thank you for acknowledging that's a fascinating talk. In your new material search system, where do you think you've made savings in time to achieve shorter discovery times? Thank you. That's a great question, right? So before this whole idea of optimizing machine learning came, uh, came to us, in order for you to look at the composition space, we never considered a 3D printer or a flow system to be enough to scan through very cleverly a 10,000 parameter space, right? So we invented this whole tool from the beginning and that gave us a 10, 10x, 30x acceleration, something like this. And that results in a saving in time cost as well as equipment cost. Otherwise we'd have to do single experiments and do a high fidelity, full characterization of the electrical transport properties in an expensive piece of equipment. So one place where we actually save time and cost is that we do not do fully accurate uh, estimations of electrical conductivity, thermoelectric properties, or whatever, magnetic properties, for all of them, we then select from a high throughput experiment 10% or fewer that are actually interesting. And we only look at high fidelity experiments in those. So you end up then only looking at the interesting samples. So for someone doing TEM or STM, for instance, you want to know, and you also always want to look at the interesting samples. So this allows you to get to the interesting space much faster. Right? So that's the idea behind doing this. Uh, Deepa S. Narang asks, uh, is it possible to make 2D layered materials from non-layered materials? Um, that is a difficult question. Uh, you can make 3D materials from 2D layered materials, but vice versa because the chemical bonding in the C axis can be quite strong, right? And then it's difficult. You have to do it through some chemical means perhaps. You can do etching, layer by layer etching, but you'll then, it, it's very difficult to get selective etching of layer by layer. So you can probably do it, but you'll damage the subsequent layers underneath as well. So that's, it's not an easy challenge, I would think. Um, Shi K. Ong asks, for the inverse design portion, could you explain the encoder and the decoder portion? Um, are both the encoder and decoder neural networks? Um, uh, no, they're not. Uh, we just use GANs, for example. Uh, read the preprint. I'm, I'm not going to answer that in detail just because we're, we only have three minutes left and I need to get through three more questions. Please read the preprint and send me an email and I'll be happy to explain that more. The forward model that links your Latin space to your property can be a neural network, but it doesn't have to be. Okay, so hope that helps. Salamat, um, I think Salamat was involved in MatMiner at some point, it was the same Salamat. How did you include dimensionality in your ML models? I think I kind of answered this previously. Is there any platforms to work with 2D materials in particular? Uh, like I said, depends on whether you're looking at ground state properties or functional properties. But in principle, once you vectorize the material and you're able to define it very carefully in a mathematical form, there is nothing preventing you from doing a machine learning algorithm to link it to some ground state or functional property. Uh, will machine learning be standalone without dependency on DFT? Absolutely. Absolutely, Ayman, because the high throughput experimental tool that we have does not use any DFT at all. So the last 15 minutes of my talk, all of the inputs is purely experimental. So you do not generate thousands of data points, but 100 to 200 is still good enough for you to do some machine learning. Ravi, uh, what is the source of magnetic impurities in MOS2? Could you characterize the impurities? Yes, there are sulfur vacancies uh, inside the system. Uh, we did characterize them through high resolution STEM, STM. Um, the preprint is available on archive. Uh, email me and I can tell you, tell you what's happening there. And Antonio had a very nice PRB paper that followed up from there uh, that tells you what is the origin of the magnetic moments in the sulfur vacancies as well. So he understands this better than I do. 
Uh, Pinseng Tsang, a European student learning doing DFT and machine learning methods. Which platforms do you use in your team use for DFT works? Using Quantum Espresso, absolutely vast for Quantum and Quantum Espresso, they both work. I forgot which platform we use for Epic Star. I'll go back and check because most of the work was actually done uh, in IHPC. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's uh, agnostic to what method you use. So yeah, thanks for all your great questions and email me if you have more. Thank you so much for this exciting talk. Everybody, I want to thank you for being here. Um, and I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. And thank you again. And I see you soon. Kedar, see, see you soon. <laughs> really. I'll see you very soon. Eh? <laughs> Bye. You so Bye, evening. folks. Have a great day ahead. Bye-bye.